What's up, guys? It's the 26th of January. I'm going to give you something a little bit different than what I normally do. I got Mr. Patrick McCarroll, another person here at SMC. And the, the cool thing about Patrick, we've never met face to face. This is the first time yeah. I've seen yeah. his face. Yeah. But what I have seen is the enormous amount of data that he puts out to the entire company. He drops out to all of us with what's happening in the market, what to look for, what things to be cognizant of with, as it affects interest rates. And when I read his stuff, I'm like, wow, this son of a bitch is ridiculously intelligent and knows it <laughs> damn near better than anybody else I've seen. And the way you detail it is so well that it helps me understand what I need to do even better. So tell me, literally, you do 27 years in the industry, right? 27 years. Yep. Yep. Study finance all through college. Um, kind of endured Series 6, Series 7 certifications along the way. Wasn't quite certain which direction I wanted to go. Um, when I got into the mortgage industry in 1997, I kind of looked around and I said, you know, these guys are making really important financial decisions and there's not really a lot of financial planning that's going along with it, right? So that kind of catapulted me staying in the mortgage business for a long time. There is zero financial planning going into it if you really think about the industry as a whole. So yeah. your philosophy is a lot like where I was coming from. I got 97 as well, but I came from the mines in New Mexico and forth got my way into this industry and then had to kind of learn it from just being taught how to do mortgages, which was, that was wild, wild west back then. Yes. So when you think about that and my learning and then you coming in from that you know, planning perspective, and we both end up in a very similar spot, which is kind of wild to think with all the education you've had, the history in this, the understanding of it, and I'm picking it up from all these different places and trying to piece it all together where how do I help the real estate investor? I like the fact that we come to this, this spot. Now, where'd you go to college at? Went to University of Texas, Arlington. Okay. University of Texas, studied mm -hmm. finance, uh, got your series six, your series seven. Mm -hmm um understanding markets and i cheated my ass off to get that c in high school went to work on the oil fields then driving truck then worked in the mines then here and here we sit bouncing stuff back and forth to each other across the country i'm in missouri you're in texas right now most of the time i spend my time in arizona but on data with respect to the market so the reason i brought him on guys is to kind of help you see a little bit more information. We're going to still have the same conversation I have every time, but it's with somebody with a little, a little bit different background, a little bit different perspective, helping different buyers, helping different people getting loans, but we end up with the same conclusions. Right. So today we got news that come out. We'll go to briefing.com here real quick. And um, let me see here. I had to close this out. The thing about my, uh, my YouTube channel here, it is the most hammer chisel kind of operation you're going to actually run into. <laughs> so... Here's what we got. Last few days, guys, we've had, um, you know, the, yeah. am I getting it coming through? Yep. Yep. It's perfect. So the things that kind of hit to hit that impact the market the most, we got initial claim, continuing claims, durable orders, durable goods, GDP, chain deflator, new home sales. Now we had the, the personal income and personal spending is interesting. That came up. I like um, the chain deflator, uh, the chain deflator, Part of the GDP um, is actual price increases, right? So it gives an idea what's happening on the grocery store level, um, what's happening to consumers on a day-by-day -day basis. So that was interesting that when GDP came out um, and it came out a little bit hotter than forecast, what kind of pulled that back a little bit was that chain deflator of actual expense cost at one and a half percent versus the forecast of two nine, as you can see there. Um, so that was a fun one to kind of see, but it also creates that headache, right? Of not, it's this, you know, tug of war between going up or going down. So it's, it's leaves us in that, that sideways trading pattern, but that was an interesting number that came out with that GDP. Yeah. So then it, and so what, when you're looking at GDP, you still have a pretty significant increase, right? But yep. shade of are pulling it down. What was the thing? What did you see driving GDP? Well, you know, you, you still have a bit it's gonna get, um, it's gonna get complicated, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it could get really nerdy in regards to what's actually pulling and, and pushing on that. Because if you see, you know, our consensus was 2%. The prior was 4.9. Um, we came out at 3.3 three here. So I'm still of the belief that a lot of shelter expenses is falsely motivating some of these numbers. Um, it's the same with the inflation protections or the inflation numbers. Um, so I, I believe that GDP is being falsely pulled along with that front as well. Um, but again, overall cost on the, on the consumer looks to be pulling down. So that that's where it's, it's interesting. 
Very cool. So then we push into, you know, personal income, personal spending. It looks like that also a little bit of a bump up from forecast. Um, so the personal I mean spending part is, is kind of driving me crazy a little bit, right? Because you're, you're looking in a situation at which, um, we can see that it's being fueled by debt, right? So it's not being fueled by, um, uh, agreed. What, credit what we right, credit used cards. to talk about before, right? Which is everybody had this bent up savings within COVID. I was able to save money. The per, you know, and the spending's coming from that backlog of, of, being able to save assets, but now you're seeing through credit card, um, the and home lending in that twenty twenty two combined. So the spending piece feels like the consumer has locked into this spending habit, right, and this way of living, and they've become entrenched in not wanting to give that lending or that the living up right i that's a level but we're doing the big on debt i agree with what you're saying there because a lot of people we're, we're seeing the wages it, everything's not showing quite accurately when it comes to income i'm seeing a lot of error in the income side of it uh at least how it's being being portrayed to the market the numbers are right. showing one thing just on the headline you get deeper into the numbers the numbers are really really uh manipulated to make it look really good in the headline now yeah. of course spending is a hey people are still spending money but how are they spending money right yeah. they're spending money like that like they're a politician they're just dumping it out there and not caring how it's going to get paid back later so that's pushing that yeah. then we got also the um we got the uh, pce came out it shows flat as far as personal consumption is concerned um you know at that point too but again guys when it comes to pce and cpi both of those are very 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 manipulated they're only showing certain things yeah. um so I'm not, I'm not certain I can't, I haven't had enough time to even dig in and digest any of that. Anything to information you can give on PCE or any thoughts on that one being as flat as it is? You know, again, that was the piece that Morgan Stanley came out yesterday um, and they downgraded their forecast for, for PCE in 2024. Um, but it, once again, it it's, was specific to shelter expense falling within the U.S. economy. Rents, um, their focus was um, when you look at shelter expense, a lot of it are rents in, in leases that were signed over 12 months ago. But in their space, they're looking specifically at new leases and what those new lease um, rents are, are going for right now. So as they're showing shelter expense, they're showing new leases on the same properties being less. Um, so they've downgraded their piece, which is falling into this actual number as well. But again, this manipulation of such a large percentage of inflation data being attached to shelter expense is kind of, you really don't, you can't get a real good gauge of where it's at. 100% with you there too. Um, now I said flat, it's not necessarily flat, it's still going up guys. It's still showing, it's yeah, still showing it's an increase. It's what I'm, what, it's a two tenths increase. It's not flat, it was the fact that actual came in the same as as um, as what was forecasted, which is which is very interesting. It doesn't usually happen that, that way. So. And like we and I talked about, you know, the one P, the way to look at this is, you know, the Fed's inflation target through monetary policy is 2%. But if you take two tenths times 12, that's 2.4% inflation growth, which is still outside the Fed's threshold. Correct. So when you're looking at this, uh, we talked earlier before we started recording, uh, you know, the Fed is claiming somewhere in the range of a CPI of 3.9%. Uh, but the real rate of inflation is so, such a significantly higher number. Uh, if you really want to start looking at things and what, what real cost of living is, what would you estimate the 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 real inflation to be personally? I mean, when you're looking at it, you're doing your your back of the napkin math. Man, the the, the I think it's double digits. Um, I I really do. I I don't think it's anywhere near as low. And this can be evidenced by your everyday life, right? My wife complains all the time that a pound of ground beef, you know, twelve months ago was. $4 and 50 cents. And now it's $8. Right. And you can see wow. these everyday items that, and, and that's what the consumer is saying. And you see this through a lot of articles and publications that, you know, everybody's talking about inflation, getting to these lower levels and everything's under control, but we as consumers, we can't feel that yet. Right. Within our grocery bill, within um, energy expenses, our light bills are still awful expensive. So if you look at the grand scheme of things, nobody feels better about their situation. And and that's the one place to gauge all of it. 
Yeah. And so the other thing also that some people may not see, like you said, the pound of ground beef, all this stuff, there's also this substitution that's happening out there, right? So you know, I think they talked about it being during, because uh, of COVID and after COVID, they're referencing more like a skimpflation, right? So you're you're going to still pay a certain amount, but you're not going to get as high a quality or yep. as much. One yep. thing I noticed before COVID, I was making orders of, you know, those blue shop towels you get at the auto parts store. Mm -hmm. I was ordering those by the case. After COVID, I'm still paying the same, if not more, for the case, but the rolls are smaller. Yeah. So yeah. I have to go find those. I got some before and some after. I'm like, there's a, there's more at play here than just the direct cost of things, guys. You need to understand that. So I'm showing here what we're the bag of chips is different. Yeah, you can feel yeah. the bag of chips differently. You can see that milk, you know, the start rate of where the milk is in the jug is going down a little bit more. So yeah, to your point, you're paying the same price and you're getting less of the product. Yep. And companies are going to be able to make it up on the on the bulk. It's where they'll yep. be able to create create more yep. revenue as a result of that. We are just be, continue to be siphoned off of in all kinds of different directions. Taxes keep going yep. up. So yep. we're getting the MBS charts, guys, that uh, we constantly hit. And what we're looking at today is we're getting squeezed in. Let me see if I can just zoom in just a little bit. I think I'm on my six month. Let's get into the one month. We're getting squeezed here between the what looks like the 50 day moving average and the got to be where are we hitting there? That's got to be the. Is that the 21, I'm thinking, on this? So yes. 50, actually, it's, no, it's the 50, no, the 50 and the 14, 21, 35. It's getting hit right there on the 14. So we're right yep. now, we're hitting the top of the 21. We're at the top of the candlestick. Right now, we're sitting right at the 14. We bounced off of the uh, 50. So we're getting squeezed right. We're pinched right at this, right below the uh, this support, which has now become this, a ceiling. You can see we bounced off of this ceiling over and over and over and over again. Now, here's here's the thing that I try to keep influencing, influencing people to think about. Everybody wants to know the rates going up, going down. Right now, we have a ceiling that used to be a support. I should be turning this red, this 90, 9983, because mm -hmm. uh, we have hit this and hit it and hit it and hit it, and we are not breaking above it. When we do break above it, what do we got? We hit moving averages that are now playing ceilings or playing uh, some sort of resistance to get there. But what's above that? We have proven. I've been talking about this for over a year. This 100.53, that is the price that was set the day they announced quantitative easing. That's where the market started the day they announced that. We were below that prior to quantitative easing. We've been above that prior to quantitative easing and went below it after quantitative tightening. We hit it and we stayed hitting that thing. So when people want to float, and I want Patrick to tell me if I'm freaking wrong here, and you, you can tell Aaron, I know this is your channel, but you don't know what the hell you're talking about. I have the degree. I have the background. I got the series, what have you. So- Here's my thought process to everybody. Even if it got better, we have way too many things above us and we have this ridiculously hard ceiling. You can't get past this ceiling, in my opinion, without quantitative easing. The Fed has to turn everything around, start dumping trillions of dollars back into the market, or at least announce they're going to. What my belief is here, we are right now bouncing off a gift, which is the gift of, of scraping the ceiling of what is available to us now. When it's high, rates are low. When it goes down, when it goes low, rates go up. This is the fan. You know, I watched the Fannie Mae 5.5 because of certain things that I'm working on in the background. Not all coupons are being watched by everybody. Now, I believe the risks favor us breaking through this support of the the 50 day and going down to this particular level of 98.89. If we do that. We're going to see about a seven eighths of a percent increase in price. Meaning, if you're getting a certain rate today, it could go up as much as nearly a full Quarter. percentage point later yeah. if you break this. Any thoughts on my philosophy here, Patrick? No, I, I think you're right. And and you and I have talked about this, and where we differ mildly is you watch MBS, I watch the 10 year, right? Because uh, the 10 year drags basically every interest rate in the United States, right? So um, the 10 years supporting the same exact philosophy. That yes, that I I called, and if you remember in my updates at the beginning of the year, I said that there was going to be a whip effect, that the market was over or over baking that March rate cut. Um, we saw quite a bit. I mean, rates went from 8.03% to 6.6 .6 within a 30-day window. It was an unbelievable drop. But yeah, I said I once once the market felt that, right? That we were gonna we were gonna have a whip effect and go back to seven, and that's really close to where we are right now. As the market started to say, "Hey, we we really don't see that that March cut happening now," and it's starting to get kicked to May at this point. 
So we're going to get back to that sideways space of, of having a Fed funds rate that's still over 500 basis points leading into May. And yeah, I'm of the mindset where if, if we can at all influence the Fed, just stay your hand for a while. Yep. Don't move crap. Let's stay here. All these people, guys, quit sitting on the sidelines waiting. I'm going to get, come off the MBS here. Quit setting, sitting on the sidelines waiting to see if the Fed lowers the rate. Mm -hmm. The problem, this is, again, I'll let Patrick tell me if I'm full of shit. But if the problem is, if the Fed starts lowering the rate and they get too aggressive with it, we have what I refer to, or I've heard referred to, is a crash up. Everything sure. goes up so fast. The price of housing goes up. The price of, uh, I mean, the, the, the market score, we can hit 40,000 in the Dow. All that happens, it gets everything gets further away from the average individual to be able to acquire. Therefore, the rich gets very rich. The average person gets further away from rich and actually further away from just being able to live your life. Don't wait for that. The other thing we've got here, 44% of the single family housing in 2023 was purchased by the hedge funds. Yes. Now, we also have information not confirmed because we don't know the future. At the head fed are on target to control up to 60 percent of the available single family housing by 2030 to 2035 if you want to stop this shit, you have to start buying and if you want to wait till the rates go down for you to buy you're going to screw yourself out of the price today do you right. remember back and i keep beating this freaking horse but if you remember back to when interest rates were in the twos it, all the agents are saying you got to come to the table at least another forty to fifty thousand dollars over list just to get in the game, and people are paying a hundred thousand over list. You literally paid for that interest rate that dropped from six down to two in buying the house for way more than you should have. We Correct. pushed prices above the actual value of the sticks and bricks. Now, do I see those values coming down? I personally don't because of inventory issues. Anything that is available gets sucked up by the hedge funds. And then we also have, guys, nobody's talked about the 12 million people that cross the damn border that need to live somewhere. They have to and occupy a home. Right. Correct. Exactly. So when you consider all those things, we have a major inventory problem that's going to keep these prices high. And if we drop the rates, it's only going to go higher and you're going to screw yourself by sitting there. Any yeah. thoughts? No, no, no. 100% accurate, champ. I mean, you're you're right there. We're dealing with a massive inventory influx. You're sitting on 82% of every person who has a mortgage loan in the United States is sitting below a 5% interest rate. 62% are sitting below four. Um, and they're sitting on a price that's 64% less than what they could get right now, right? So if they were to drop it, they would have to move up their price by 64% and take on a higher rate. So that move up cost right now is the most dramatic it's been in history, like at any point in time in history. So what that's doing is, is that's locking in a certain percentage of US homeowners to where that's what's suppressing the inventory at such a massive level that normally historically in the past, if you wanted to sell your property, it was because of a specific need, right? Or a want, let's call it this. I want a better bathroom. I want more bathrooms. I want a, a different kitchen. Like so, and that's where the average American only occupied their property for for seven to eight years. If you remember that back in the two thousands, I mean, it was most people would dump it four to five years, and that want of something different would take over because the move up expense wasn't nearly as dramatic as it is today. Now we're seeing the wants have been completely suppressed, meaning. I want a better bathroom, but I can't afford to do it. And the ones have gone to specific needs. And it's only those that are abandoning those positions have been relocated for work or they've had an increase in family size that they just can't do it anymore based on their size. So as you've gone into specific needs and not the ones, it's suppressed that inventory level to a point that if interest rates were to drop to five and a half today, we would repeat that model you just talked about where... 17% of home sales paid over $100,000 to get into the property. 67% of home sales were at least something over what the contract sales price was. And we would just duplicate that all over again. And what's crazy about that, guys, is the, the, the property prices has not dropped down to be able to absorb that duplication to where you're right. not putting yourself in a really, really, really shitty position. It's only going to compound. So. Yep we have here is the makings of a of a subscription based economy period that's how why that's what's being built here you have two choices you can be the subscriber or the person offering the subscription that's it that's all that's left so if you're not going to buy investment real estate you will become the subscriber or your children will your children's children i am out there buying every damn thing i can afford to get that makes sense 
to be sure that my children have a place to live and my children's children, because it's all being wrapped up into our big family trust. Because if I don't do that, they don't have a shot at this. And if you don't jump in here and start working and start deciding that you're going to make a difference and you're going to start changing the trajectory of your family, guess what? Your name's going into oblivion because nobody's going to remember you. And I'm not trying to be quick about this, but the next few generations are going to remember the one guy that changed the direction. You have the point and the opportunity right now to change it because it's getting changed right in front of you. And if you don't start acting and start making some phone calls and getting going right now, it's all gone. It's just gone. This is the perfect time, you know, because the the if you look at the hesitancy of an investor, right, the hesitancy is rent loss, right, of am I going to get into something at which um, somebody's going to be gone and I can't rent it for four months and I've got to occupy that payment. Like that's one of the biggest hesitancies of investment properties. But as you're talking about the influx of what's coming across the border, population growth, builders who are putting out less than 700,000 properties per year, they're not keeping up with even population growth, much less um, immigration that's coming in as well. So we're going to stay in this stagnant below normal housing number for a very long time. So that one hesitancy of this rent loss scenario has been thrown out the window because there are still to this day, all of my property managers, everybody that's engaged in this on a day by day basis, it doesn't really bother them if somebody, you know, is not wanting to renew their lease or what have you not, because they have 15 people that are sitting there waiting to take over and occupy that space. And, and it's never happened before. So even looking at the past 12 months, I mean, look at home growth. Home growth went up 6.7% year over year. So once again, we're we're not in 20%, which is what the Fed specifically wanted to stop, but they can't do anything more, right? They can't, they can't slow it down any more than what they already have. So we're still going to see this something between five to nine percent annualized growth. And again, if interest rates fall to five and a half, which is what the MBA NAR, um, Goldman Sachs, everybody's projecting that 2025, we're going to see rates in the fives. The inventory channel is not going to correct itself. At some point in time, we're going to have that conversation again of overbidding competitiveness that's going to occupy housing once again. And if they are right, which is possible, because believe me, they're influencing things in the background, the lobbyists, whatever, yeah. right? And it does get to that point. You better damn well have houses because if you don't, you're not going to be able to get them. I don't care what that no. interest rate is. No. Because the cost is going to be so high, you better have an enormous amount of capital in hand to put down payments. So I appreciate you taking the time. We're going to be coming back around. There's so much we can talk about this stuff. The bottom line, guys, is you get in the damn game now. If you're on the sidelines, you're going to be stuck there. Appreciate you, Patrick. Uh, guys, we'll get back to you on Tuesday. Thanks. Thank you, brother.